pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here it is, another Sunday night, another glass of wine, and another 10 books tag. So, first off, the name. This is becoming a ridiculous and lovely running joke on BookTube. What is the name of this tag? So, I have taken the liberty. I'm the originator, damn it! I have taken the liberty as the supreme creator <laughs> of this tag to attempt uh, a minimalist name going forward. But I don't think anybody's going to follow me. So that's fine. Call it whatever the hell you want. But I'm renaming this the 10 books tag. Now there's some people, you know, wimpy book video producers like Steve Donahue can't quite summon up the wherewithal to do 10 books, but they might he might have to call it the 5 books tag and then do 7 and a half and that's fine. But I appreciated Memento Mori's critique of the grab and gab name that Steve had proposed. The verb gab does have a bit of a blue rinse set connotation to it, so not wanting to be associated with such a milieu, I'm not going to use grab and gab anymore, but Steve can, and any other blue rinse booktubers. <laughs> But casual, I forget exactly what the Memento Mori called it, casual 10 books tag or something. And that's fine, he can, he can use that, but I'm proposing the 10 books tag. Let's just get started. Call it whatever the hell you want, just please do it, because it's other booktubers seem to be responding to this kind of loose, baggy, anti-tag tag. So I have 10 books, some I've read, some I haven't, some I have in my possession, some I only have in ebook, some I don't own. And I'm going to discourse upon them. See, Memento Mori, that's why I can't use the word casual in my video. Because I like occasionally throwing in words like discourse. The first one I want to talk to you about is a book that I ogled uh, yesterday at uh, Kinokuniya, which is the bookstore in Tokyo that has the largest English language selection. Like... It's amazing. They have new releases. I've noticed this from conversations I've had here on BookTube with Peg. I can get books here that are newly released before she can find them in the U.S. And so I went there last night and I was browsing around. My eye gravitated towards books that I'd never heard of before. And one of them, and I don't know how new it is. I didn't actually check that. Quite new anyway. Is a new English translation of a Taiwanese novel very experimental novel. I'm not sure I actually want to read this book, and I didn't buy it. I probably would have bought it had it not been $40 for a soft cover. But now I see Amazon Japan, it's like more like $100. So, <laughs> but no, I wasn't willing to shell out that kind of money, but I'm still really fascinated by the book. The title in English is Remains of Life, and the writer, his pen name anyway, is Wu Ha. I guess it's his given name, Christian name, if I can use that in an Asian context, is huh, spelled H-E. And the uh, pronunciation research I've done, that's what I've found. Wu Ha. And this is a experimental novel about a aspect of Taiwanese history that I knew nothing about. Even if I don't end up reading this book, I want to find out more about it. And this is during the Japanese colonial occupation of Taiwan, which ended at the end of World War II. So this is a true story from 1930. There was a school sporting event at an elementary school on an aboriginal reservation in the mountains of Taiwan. The name of the tribe is the Atayal tribe and an uprising occurred and 134 Japanese soldiers or colonial officials were beheaded at this school sporting event. And this is the first time that any such thing had happened during any of Japan's colonial misadventures. And they responded with a militia of 3,000 and almost wiped the tribe out using poisonous gas that was banned internationally and heavy artillery and whatnot. 
So 70 years later, this very famous Taiwanese writer that I've never heard of, his pen name is Wu He, his real name is Chen Guo Cheng, became interested in this incident, which is known as the Musha Incident, and tracked down survivors. And of the, like I say, the Atayel tribe was almost completely wiped out. And based on what stories they told him, he's written this very experimental stream of consciousness novel with no paragraph breaks i'm a little put off by no paragraph breaks that's one thing i don't really do well with but i'm i might try it if i can find a copy for less than forty dollars and i certainly would like to know more about the incident the second book i want to talk to you about is a novel that i read and very much enjoyed this year four or five months ago and i don't have a copy i did it on ebook called The Gustav Sonata by Rose Tremaine, who's a British novelist, and this was my first by her. But I loved it, and I want to read much, much more of her stuff. But this novel is set in Switzerland, and it's about two Swiss boys who befriend each other, and there's some homoeroticism in the beginning of their relationship, but it never really goes beyond that, but it becomes a lifelong friendship. It's a very quiet story, and there's a long backstory about one boy's parents. Uh, during the years leading up to the outbreak of war, as most of us know, Switzerland was neutral during the war, but it was a very jittery place to be as Hitler was overrunning the continent. And the backstory of the parents during those years is fascinating. And it's a very quiet novel with every 45 or 52 pages, there's this incredible burst of emotional or erotic narrative energy that just grabbed hold of me and, and held my interest from, from start to end. So it's a bit of a gay story. It's not really a war story, but it's about uh, the, the plight of the Jews in Switzerland during the war or leading up to the war it's about getting old it's about finding love and being alone so many things and so understated i can't wait to read my next rose tremaine novel i think the next one i might try is music and silence if i'm remembering the title right it's supposed to be really good but she is a fascinating writer the next one this is the first one i actually have in my possession is uh, an american novel as good as gone by larry watson now that cover transfixes me. I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan, Canada. It was, I felt like a fish out of water growing up on a farm because I was not a typical farmer's son. If you've watched approximately one and a half of my videos, you might know what I'm talking about. But as I get older, I become more and more drawn to fiction about farms. And so it's for that express reason that I picked this up maybe a year ago. And Larry Watson is a an American novelist, was born in North Dakota, lives in Wisconsin, and this is his 10th novel. So what I understand it to be about, I haven't read it yet, is about an old cowboy from the, like the old cowboy days. The story happens in 1960, and he's virtually a hermit. He's living off the grid, and he's estranged from his family, and just kind of an old Marlboro man. And then his uh, adult son who I guess is a single dad, reaches out to him for help, even though they're been estranged, to look after his kids while he has to go somewhere for a week. And so it's about this old guy, this steely, hardened cowboy, taking care of his grandchildren and uh, kind of coming back into his old life for a week. Now that kind of thing, it sounds like it, it's a, the kind of emotional story that I respond to, but it can often go off the rails and uh, I may or may not end up liking it but it's the kind of story that can work for me has anybody read any Larry Watson novels I haven't so I'll let you know next is one that's it's on my TBR I don't have a physical copy or any so sort of copy but I'm really curious about this especially now that I've just I've had so much fun doing the research to do this video so I want to read all of these books right now <laughs> Alina Bronsky is the writer, and she is a Russian-born German writer. This is her maybe second novel, and it's ca called, wonderful title, The Hottest Dishes of the Tartar Cuisine. 
and it just sounds wonderful. And it's quite new, like maybe this year, last year or something. Set primarily in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet era. And the mother is Rosa. And she has a 17-year-old daughter who is has gotten herself pregnant. Rosa is a nasty, wily woman. And she doesn't want to have a grandchild. And so she tries everything she can to terminate the pregnancy. But the, the girl is born. And the grandmother, or Rosa, falls in love with her granddaughter, but still doesn't really love her daughter very much. And there's this weird family dynamic that grows up between them. And like it sounds like a crazy story. And then the granddaughter becomes a teenager. And there's a sleazy German cookbook writer who's researching Tartar cuisine and this grandmother, Rosa, orchestrates some grand plot involving her sexy granddaughter and the German cookbook writer's lust for her to get them all, grandmother, mother, and granddaughter, out of the USSR. So that's basically all I've gathered from reading the synopsis. And I don't usually read the synopses, but it sounds madcap. Sometimes that works for me, sometimes it doesn't. But I'm curious about this. Has anybody read Alina Bronsky or this novel? Her first novel was called Broken Glass Park. I'm curious. Another one I've been curious about for almost two years. I first heard about it on Litzy. And it's a 1942 novel from Hungary that's kind of newly rediscovered internationally. Called Embers by Kandor Mari is how the Hungarians pronounce this guy's name. If I didn't know any better, I'd say Sandor Marai, but in Hungarian, Chandor Mary. The synopsis doesn't do much for me, but apparently the writing is beautiful, so I, I'm going to try it. It's set in a secluded woodland castle, and there's an old general. His wife has been dead for years. Is, prepare, is preparing to meet an old friend from his youth who had also known his wife, and there had been some mysterious something or other they'd all experienced together, the three of them. And after 40 years, this friend is coming to meet him, and it's the story of their long, confrontational, deeply emotional, passionate reminiscences during this reunion. And that's all I know. Beautiful-looking book. The next one is a book I don't have and I'm curious about, and this is also one of those books where it really depends on the writing and whether the author can pull it off, but I'm, I'm drawn to checking it out. And that is a British novel from maybe this year or last year called Let Go My Hand by Edward Docks. His name looks unpronounceable, D-O-C-X. It looks like a Microsoft word suffix, but apparently it's pronounced Docks. And this is about a adult son and his father, and his father wasn't a very good father, but very charismatic and larger-than-life man with several marriages and all these children from each wife. And at this stage, at the as the story opens, he's dying. He's an old man, and he's dying. And he asks his sons to accompany him on one last trip across Europe. And so that's the premise. Now, that kind of a story, it can land or, or not, but when it works, it's, a, it's the kind of a novel that I, I love. So I'm, I'm curious about that. I've never heard of Edward Docks, but he was apparently a booker long-listed for his novel Self-Help. So any of you that know anything about his writing, please weigh in. I'm curious. I have mentioned a few times on this channel, NYRB Classics. And I, I've said I haven't been so impressed with what I've read, and this is the one that I loved. This is the only one that I've loved so far. And I've read maybe three, maybe f or four. This is a memoir, An African in Greenland, by Tete Michelle Pomassi. And I heard about it on Litzy, and I ordered it, and I read it, and I absolutely loved it. Tete Michelle Pomassi is from Togo in Africa. And the memoir opens with a story about his childhood in Togo that could have been the beginning of a mesmerizing novel involving voodoo and witchcraft and this and that. And I was just blown away by that story. 
But then we kind of jump ahead and he's a teenager or in a, in a young man and he's browsing in a bookstore and sees a book about Greenland and he'd never heard about Greenland <laughs> growing up in Togo and he becomes fascinated with Greenland. And so it takes him about three or four years to get his ducks in a row and he goes to Greenland. And so this is exactly what the title says and it's about his adventures spending a, a year or two in Greenland. Now it made me realize that you couldn't pay me to go to Greenland. It just sounded like a horrible place but he, it was the fulfillment of his dream and the writing is so beautiful. It's one of the best memoirs that I've ever read. So if you're interested in Greenland, if you're interested in really beautiful memoiristic writing, I can't recommend it enough. So Togo, I guess they're French speaking in Togo, so I guess it used to be a French colony. I don't know much about Togo other than what I read here. The English translation is by James Kirkup, who is a gay British poet and memoirist, essayist. And the translation, maybe the translation is better than the original. I have no idea, but the, the writing is so beautiful. So now this is interesting. This was the most interesting part of the background research I did to prepare for this video, which is James Kirkup was a gay poet and very out and militantly gay back in the 60s and 70s. And he wrote a poem for a gay newspaper. I forget exactly when, but the 1970s. It's in Wiki on his Wikipedia page. Exactly when for the gay news newspaper in the voice of a Roman centurion lusting after Jesus Christ. And the newspaper was charged for blasphemy because of that poem, and they lost. Now, that just is <laughs> ridiculous, but that was that was the way things were back then. But more personally, until a few minutes ago, when I heard the name James Kirkup, I thought about uh, a novel called P.S. Your Cat is Dead. But I've just tonight sorted it all out. No, that's another gay writer, an American gay writer, James Kirkwood, who wrote the 1972 novel P.S. Your Cat is Dead, which actually was first a play. So he wrote the play and then he adapted it into a novel, which is interesting. And I had a copy, and maybe I still do, in a box in Canada, but I had a copy for many years that I never read. I don't think I ever read it. But I once saw a Fringe Festival production of the play. So the play, or the story, so this, this is a bit of a segue. So this is my 11th book because I have 10 books, but then this little rabbit hole thing is going to add an 11th book to the discussion. The story in P.S. Your Cat is Dead is about a man who comes home and finds there's a burglar burglarizing his apartment. So he ties the burglar up and somehow, I don't know if it's in the novel because I haven't read the novel, but in the play, or at least the production that I saw, he ends up tying the burglar up with his pants down. So the in the production I saw, this lovely pair of buttocks were exposed for the duration of the play. And I, that's all I really remember about it. I couldn't really pay attention <laughs> to the play after that. The burglar is gay. And the conversation between the man whose home it is and the burglar leads to the apartment resident questioning his own sexuality. So that's a very interesting premise especially for a 1972 play or novel but that is James Kirkwood not James Kirkup but I have a feeling that James Kirkup and James Kirkwood would have gotten along just fine the next book I have is by a Colombian novelist and a new translation this year I believe in English the children by Carolina Sanin it's a short little novel beautiful cover I don't remember, I think I heard about it on Twitter and just had to order a copy. 160 pages. And it's about a woman who finds a mysterious young boy on the pavement outside her apartment in the middle of the night. And he doesn't know who he is or where he comes from. And she, the rest of the novel is her trying to figure out who he is or what to do with him. A haunting story of fantasy, mystery, and bureaucracy. From one of Colombia's most talented young writers. Who knows? But I'm curious. So here is a, another NYRB, New York Review of Books, book that I picked up used here in Tokyo for about three bucks. It's called All About H. Hatter by G. V. Dasani. So this is an Indian novel. 
The cover is interesting. Never heard of the book or the writer. And I'm not really sold on the, the blurb. Especially, I mean, I I don't read the, the black back cover synopses as a general rule. And I find the hyperbole really off-putting. Like, I don't believe it. I don't believe really anything they say about how good it is or whatever. Just like I don't really believe blurbs from other authors as a general rule. But this one just makes me... This hyperbolic bullshit just makes me want to puke. Listen to this. So I'm not judging the novel based on its synopsis or the hyperbole of the blurb writer, but listen to this. Wildly funny and wonderfully bizarre, all about H. Hatter is one of the most perfectly eccentric and strangely absorbing works modern English has produced. Really? And I've never heard of this book, and you've never heard of this book? I, I bet Steve Donahue has never heard of this book. And it's one of the most ex perfectly eccentric and strangely absorbing works modern English has produced. Just shut up. That's stupid. Maybe it's a good book. I will reserve judgment on that, but that kind of a blurb makes me see red. <laughs> I'm not really sold on this, even putting that aside. The main character, H. Hatter, I don't know how you pronounce Hatter, he's the son of a European merchant officer and a lady from Penang, which is an island in Malaysia, and he's being raised and educated in missionary schools in Calcutta. And this is his story of his search for enlightenment. And as soon as I hear the phrase search for enlightenment, I know it's probably not a book for me. So he's visiting seven oriental cities. So there's another, buzz, there's another word that turns me off. He consults with seven sages each of whom gives him some wisdom. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hate this book, but <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Anthony Burgess writes the introduction, and he says, It's the language that makes the book. It is not pure English. It is like Shakespeare, Joyce, and Kipling, gloriously impure. Well, I'll try it. The last book I have for today's 10 books tag is... A novel from Eritrea that I read last year. It's called Amid the Chaos by Nathan Mogus. I was moved to buy it and read it because I barely knew anything about Eritrea, never mind anything about the literature of Eritrea. I was getting more and more into African literature, and for some reason I was thinking about Eritrea and said, well, what? I wonder what novels are available from that country within five minutes I'd ordered this book off the internet and I'm glad I did it was not a really a successful novel but it sure was interesting so the first thing to say is it's self-published the second thing to say is if you google the author's name it's pretty cute published in 2016 Nathan Mogo said he lives in uh, Norway now I think there's videos of him and stuff on YouTube and it's published by Nathan Haddish Mogus Publishing <laughs> So, self-publishing. This is a great example of why self-publishing is kind of a joke. He didn't need a self-publishing. He needed, he needed an editor. But there are some things about this that I liked. The characterization is really good. It opens with the main character, Cheng Kalo, who is a uh, perpetual student of the university in Ankara. He's been haphazardly studying there so long that his former classmates are now his instructors. He's put his studies on hold, and he is working as a cash register sales and repair man. So he visits his customers at this bar and that restaurant and this store, and he knows all the tricks to extricate coins and bills that get trapped in the cash registers and put them in his own pocket. So that's brilliant. Within a few short pages, the main character is just incredibly vivid. But... There's a lot of grammar mistakes and vocabulary mistakes, maybe at the rate of one every five or ten pages. We get a lot of diary excerpts from this guy, Chen Kello, about his aspirations to write, and those are almost unbearable to read. Then we meet his best friend, Ms. Gay, and Ms. Gay is darker-skinned and Chen Kello is lighter-skinned, so there's an interesting dynamic of rivalry and uh, tension in their relationship. Based on that, that was pretty interesting. And they go out on the town every night. You know, it's kind of the North Korea of Africa, and the security forces are everywhere, and they're kind of 
in fear of the security forces. So that was all very interesting, but kind of told in kind of a cat and mouse game kind of way. So I never really got a sense of how scary was it with all this these security guards chasing them and following them. I never really got a clear sense of how repressive Eritrean society actually was. But they had a great nightlife. And then there were the long political discussions between Chinkello, Mizge, and their professor. And that was almost unbearable to read. I'm sure it's important, but it reminded me of... I studied Russian history, and including the Russian novel of ideas, Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done. It's a seminal text in Russian socialist thought, and it's just terrible to read. It, I mean, it's, as literature, it's just terrible. And... Their political discussions reminded me of that. Just ponderous. There's things in this book that were really interesting and some literary talent, and I wish that he would give up the vanity press and get an editor or keep working on his writing because I would probably try another book by him. So that is a very long 10 books tag. I'm going to tag some new people, new to me, lovely booktuber Literary Prince, I tag, and Claire reads books. I can't remember if I've tagged her on this particular tag, but I'll do it again. And a little bit presumptuous to wonderful booktubers who I'm just starting to uh, get to know by watching their channel. Garden's Scriptorium and Mel's Bookland Adventures. So if you feel like doing this tag, that would be wonderful. And that is my tag video. Thank you for watching. Thank you.